last time on Presidential Strategy. Hello, my name is Anna Shaven with LPAC TV. I'm Leona Fan Chang with the LPAC Basement Team. We have a number of guests with us today, here in the studio and abroad. Here with us, we have Ben Dennison of the LPAC Basement Team. Hi. Hi, Ben. Hey. And also joining us from Boston, we have candidates Rachel Brown and in Houston, Keisha Rogers. Now, the key that Mr. LaRouche outlined in this address is that both of these policies, the perpetual war and the destruction of the economy, not just the collapse, but the intentional destruction of our economy, is going to kill a lot of people. What the basement is saying is we need to now make our orientation a discussion of mankind's imperative to explore and colonize space beginning with Mars. They say the best defense is progress. In fact, that's how they open the report. And this isn't just a trick to avoid talking about war or debt or any of the other bad things that are happening. This is a policy to make war and empire obsolete. What the American people really need now is really to expand their imagination. Just look at the American, look, look, at, look at what's going on in America, look at the human species, and just ask the question, what do we actually need to get out of this crisis? What do we actually need to advance mankind as an actual scientific conception. What we need is mankind's full presence in space. You kind of have to lay the groundwork to give people a sense of the environment we're living in. So we have to go through a little bit of what is in that report. Um, living on a body that's not isolated in empty space. We're living on a, on a planet that's intimately connected with what the sun does, solar activity, uh, you know, asteroids, comet impacts are obviously a serious threat. We've seen you know, the famous case of the effect that happened with the dinosaurs, whatever the effect of the uh, asteroid strikes that happened around the time of their extinction. So it's an obvious real thing. Uh, so the question is, is the human species, what does this pose as an existential challenge for the human species to take up? Right? Hmm. This, this is our home. And it's not just a collection of uh, balls of gas orbiting around each other. It's a growing, changing, developing system. The question is, how do you not just how do you know these things, but how do you evolve mm -hmm. consciously? And I, this is the way that, which reminds me exactly of how LaRouche is posing the, the necessity of having uh, the Hamiltonian credit system, because you have to have a way to determine the, your own, um, to willfully determine, determine the, your next step. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, it, but it also is not just it can determine your next step, but then it also says that the way that he's discussed the credit system as being able to do that is, is, a, uh, is a universal concept. It's not just that it would be something good to do to evolve, but this is something that the universe is doing. And if mm -hmm. we don't do it, then we go extinct like the dinosaurs. All right, so I just like to take the same idea from another perspective, which is that of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Because uh, this is, as LaRouche speaks about often, this was the beginning of the credit system here in the United States, but especially in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And so, you know, what, what was it? How did that occur? I'd just like to, to speak about a little bit. Um, so for, for one, what was happening in the colonies um, was that there was a lack of currency. Uh, when the colonists would come over, uh, they'd have a certain supply of actual money when they came over, and as soon as they spent that for their goods to set up their house and things like this, they, they ran out of cash. There was no more money. Um, so this posed problems for the development of the colony. One, there was problems of foreclosures and uh, indebtedness. If, if someone had no money to pay, to pay off their debt to a creditor, that creditor could take their land and their house, leaving them homeless and you know, uh, an indentured servant or something like this. So the Massachusetts Bay Colony took actions from the very beginning to protect their citizens and their, their colony and the development of what they actually began to call a country 
um, very early on. They took actions to protect the development of the people and the economy of the Massachusetts Bay Colony outside of the restriction of the money available. So one thing was that you know, all of these citizens who are in, in danger of foreclosure, they passed laws to protect these people. Uh, there was one law passed attempting to um, uh, attempting to take over the debt of certain cases where the debt could not be paid. Uh, they act, passed laws to help prevent foreclosure and especially they worked to promote the internal development of the country. Now, how could they do this without money? The general court took actions, one, to promote manufacturers in the colony through things like uh, promoting the production of cotton and clothing. Um, they attempted to subsidize that and, and pass laws to promote the development of, of textiles, uh, mines. There was laws to pr protect uh, the uh, discoverer of a mine, and also, especially, finished iron goods. Uh, so one key thing was the creation of the Sagas Iron Works, which was uh, aided was aided by the actions of the, the general court. Um, although it was financed by a private group, uh, the John Winthrop uh, organized from England, the court attempted to make sure that it was a public investment, that the citizens of the Massachusetts Bay Colony could invest into it, hoping eventually that they could take full ownership of the company. Uh, they uh, forced the Massachusetts, forced the Saugus Iron Works to supply the iron needs of the colony first, and not to export for profit. And this brought up a point of contention between the colony and the owners of the company, the, the, the private backers of the company in England, so they wanted to export this stuff for a profit. If the colonists had no money to buy the goods, it did them no, it, no good to produce the goods. What John Winthrop said is, well, it does us no good to produce this stuff for you if it doesn't help us develop. It doesn't matter if we don't have money if, you know, if, uh, it's, not, if it's doing nothing to develop, to develop our, our colonists. To develop our, our colony. This is the, the reason we have this here. So from the very beginning there was a, a clear distinction between the policy of uh, one that promoted a monetary interest and one that promoted the development of the citizens productive capacities and their well-being. That was legislated from the very beginning. So you had the, the Saugus Ironworks was one part of this and then the second aspect, the, the, means of, the means of commerce, they created in 1652, coining their own, own currency, the pine tree shilling. So you had the two things, you had the Sagas Ironworks, and you also had the creation in 1652 of a sovereign currency, the pine tree shilling. And Cotton Mather had some interesting thoughts on, on the role of, of money, uh, which I'd like to share. Um, this isn't something he wrote later in 1691 on the role of paper currency, but definitely getting to the qu question of the role of money in an economy. He says, you know, sir, you and I have had some former discourse about the nature of money. That as such, it is but a counter or measure of men's proprieties, and instituted mean of permutation. As metal, indeed, it is a commodity, like all other things that are merchantable, but as money, it is no more than what was said. So he said, we didn't need the hard coin as long as we, we had uh, in a means of permutation. Hmm. Right, and actually, I, I just thought of this, but uh, the things that you had mentioned earlier, the industries that you had mentioned earlier, if you had depended on Britain to finance something like that, it would have never happened because they would definitely not want colonies to have their own textile industry and their own iron industry. Hmm. Right, as soon as they found out the colony was, was doing this, they tried to shut it down. 
uh, through things like the Navigation Acts. Um, the second point uh, that Mather makes is, is also a, a clear understanding of the role of a monetary system in preventing the development of a, of a nation. He says, you know, right now, he says we have paper currency. Uh, he says, is there not hereby 40,000 running cash in the country more than there ever was? If men's folly hinder not its currency, paper money, yea, and more than they are ever like to have, so long as they cannot keep silver in the country, which they will never do while the European trade continues. And that is like to be as long as we are a people. Silver in New England is like the water of a swift running river, always coming and is fast going away. So again, he's cognizant of the fact that if limited to a particular physical you know, metal, a, a, an amount of, of metal, amount of you know, money, if that's allowed to restrict their development, they will, will never ever possibly develop. So they're very conscious of it from the very beginning, the pine tree shilling, promoting the, the, the manufacturers, promoting the creativity of their of their colony in general that from the beginning massachusetts bay had better means of production and better technology than england and the saugus ironworks was uh producing eight tons of iron a week more than any any ironworks in england um so then after um Around after the takeover of William Orange of the throne of England in 1688, there was moves to clamp down on the colonists' independence and their self-government, uh, but the seed had already been set. Now Franklin, who was around in the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony of Cotton Mather, Increase Mather, John Winthrop Jr., he carries on the same exact policy to Philadelphia. Because as a boy, Franklin was you know, living in Boston, went to the house of Cotton Mather. Uh, Franklin's father was part of the circles of government of, of the colony, so he was aware of, you know, he was part of these, these social groups. Uh, he moves on to Philadelphia and begins the same tradition, carries on the same ideas to somewhere that was not as under control of the British. Uh, sets up some of the same types of institutions that the Mathers did. Increase in, in Cotton Mather had societies to promote useful knowledge, uh, the Philosophical Society. Franklin set up the same institutions uh, in, in Philadelphia and also wrote his own treatise on the role of paper currency, making, making the same, same point. When Franklin then creates the environment uh, as a dominating personality around the Constitution and the Constitutional Convention, uh, which Hamilton, also being a central genius figure in, uh, you know, took up the same ideas uh, himself of, of a credit system. Uh, legislating uh, first in the Constitution, uh, Article 1, Section 8, the, the, ro the role of Congress in, in coining money for the interests of the preamble for the general welfare. And two, then setting up the national bank and credit system for the United States as, his, as being the first treasury secretary. And unifying the debt of the states into a central debt, which he used then as a blessing. So taking uh, taking what, what was a debt and turning it into a form of credit for development. So and that's... That was something that that we had discussed because uh, that was this this question of the debt, you know, which a lot of people are discussing today. Uh, you can look look and see what these guys did, and then also uh, what Franklin Roosevelt did with the passage of Glass Steagall, and what Mr. Larouche has has made the point on is that uh, you know the way it's being discussed today is crazy. That. You need to pass a Glass-Steagall because you need to figure out what debts are legitimate and what debts are illegitimate. 
But then it seems like what you're going through is really how the United States developed an idea of how to deal with debt because there's never been a point in our history, even when we first got here, when we had enough money to do what we wanted to do. We started out in debt, you know, right off the, right off of the ships. And so it, you know, what seems like a complete conjunctural crisis today is not. It's something that what you're making very clear is it's something that's very natural to the, to the process of our country. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And if you take this conception that Rachel laid out in terms of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and this idea of what a credit system represents, we're talking about something that's not just a, uh, a policy of someone's opinion, but we're talking about a governing principle of the universe. And this idea of a credit system is the determina determining factor of what allows man to increase his ability uh, to continue to progress, progress in the universe. And, you know, you look at this from the standpoint of, you know, the, the credit system uh, going back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, going to what shaped the development of our U.S. Constitution and what Alexander Hamilton actually defined in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, but also what is the governing principle of natural law in our uh, constitutional preamble, uh, the preamble to our Constitution Declaration of Independence, in which Alexander Hamilton had a very key role in developing and crafting. And when you look at what these founding fathers understood about the nature of man and the fact that there should be put no limitations on the growth and the progress and the scientific uh, and creative development of mankind. This is actually a principle that is defined in our U.S. Constitution. And you can see that fight over that very principle continuing to manifest itself throughout the entirety of our uh, development of our republic and uh, throughout our constitution and the fight over our constitution because you get at this very question of the nature of a credit system versus a monetary system. Now when you look at this you can see why this has shaped the very fight over the uh, over the over the development of our entire uh, existence of our nation state of our republic uh, and even beforehand of the nature of man and this question of uh, the development and advancements of mankind. Now you look at the credit system from the standpoint of of that very view. It really you know gets at this uh, fundamental idea of you know this concept of why it is that you've had an empire, an imperial, evil imperial control to limit the growth of populations, and not only limit the growth of populations, but has been explicit in its target to, uh, to depopulate the planet and mankind to some less than a billion people, to less than a few billion people on the planet. And it has been this rejection of this policy of a credit system organizing the development of higher and higher states uh, of, of uh, it, it, higher and higher states of, of of creative output of your population. And so once you you have the example here of what Rachel laid out. Uh, with the Massachusetts Bay Colony and how this was actually taken on to further develop the uh, progress which shaped our Constitution. Uh, and you can see this manifesting itself throughout uh, the course of history and other periods. Uh, I just wanted to give a few examples of what happened during the period uh, of the one first starting with the 1837 crash, the crash of 1837, uh, and the fact that you had a very ugly, dirty figure in uh, controlling government at that time, who was a puppet of the British Empire, Andrew Jackson. And Mr. LaRouche actually talked about Andrew Jackson just yesterday on his 
uh, State of the Union address and uh, basically described him very adequ adequately as a, a democratic whore, as he said. And I think that one thing we can look at in terms of what Andrew Jackson represented was going against everything in which the human creative mind stands for and what identifies progress in our uh, in our Constitution and within the domain of what mankind should be representing. And so when Andrew Jackson in 1837, well first of all, you know, he this whole collapse that led to the crisis of 1837, you know, had been going on since about 1829 and you you saw a spiraling down uh, with the uh, introduction of the currency, the printing of money, similar to what we're seeing today, uh, with no intrinsic value over that, that money. Uh, and in 1837, you saw the height of that crash. Now, during that time, you had a very um, unique figure and character that was coming into the scene of the political spectrum uh, and starting his political career, uh, who became a very a uh, great historic leader of our nation uh, later on and became president, which was uh, Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln in 1837 uh, gave one of his most famous speeches uh, in the Illinois State House as state, state legislature in Illinois on this question of national banking. Because Lincoln was a key uh, collaborator and admirer of the Henry Clay Whigs, uh, the American system of political economy. And the American system goes back to what Rachel was describing uh, as the concept of, you know, the rejection of the British colonial system, the idea of starting uh, the development of sovereign, a sovereign nation state, uh, which later on led to our, the de development of our constitution. And so, Lincoln was very an uh, adamant uh, proponent of the concept of national banking, uh, internal improvements, and uh, one of the things that he was absolutely reject absolutely rejected was the shutdown of the second national bank of Alexander Hamilton that had been implemented by Andrew Jackson, and once you had this shutdown of the na Second National Bank uh, by Andrew Jackson, this set the stage for a ripple effect in the whole process of uh, destroying what the co concept of the credit system in which uh, Alexander Hamilton had defined in our Constitution's Article 1, Section 8 of our U.S. Constitution. And so what Lincoln was adamant about was that internal improvements, uh, the de development of major infrastructure projects, canal systems, rail systems, all of these things were the embodiment and foundation of our nation's existence. And what the Jacksonians represented was a uh, rejection or uh, actually allowing for the development of the nation to go backwards by allowing for the money changers and the financial control to take precedent over the needs of uh, the population. And Lincoln was, Lincoln was adamantly against that. And what de developed and shaped his entire career uh, as of you know going into his political career starting the state legislature is his determined fight to fight for the principles of a credit system as a universal principle governing our constitution and you can see that he carried that on throughout the existence of his entire career uh, including when he became president of the United States and you know, he was a major proponent of these American system Whig, Whig policies. And one of the things that uh, Lincoln, uh, in, in his presidency, hold on a second. <clears throat> now, 
Now, in his presidency, at the height of the Civil War, uh, when you first had the Civil War uh, coming about, after what had happened with uh, Andrew Jackson destroying the national banking system, uh, going with the uh, continued policies of uh, fractional reserve banking, you know, this totally destroyed banking policies in, in, at that point in time. And so one of the things that is interesting that you find is that at, as the uh, start of the, the Civil War is starting to take off, um, you have remarks that are being, that are presented by the Chancellor at that time of Germany, uh, Adam von Bismarck, on the nature of what actually was driving this civil war. Now, what he, de what he determined was that it wasn't just the, uh, the act of division of the southern states from the northern states and the division of the Union uh, and the slave, uh, with, with the fight over slavery, but that what you were witnessing was the fight of the monetarist uh, financial uh, system uh, wanting to continue to control uh, its monetary interests. And so what Bismarck identified was that the fight that led into the Civil War was that the money changers had claimed that if they couldn't have their central banking, then they were going to have war. Now, this should pose as something uh, that is sort of uh, interesting to people because we're seeing similar situations today. And if they couldn't have their license to print the money uh, that they wanted uh, and to continue to print the money to, to bail out their system and to continue to keep their monetary system afloat, then they were going to war was their option. And so what uh, Chancellor Bismarck showed was that slavery was not the only cause of the uh, American Civil War and that the division, he says, the division of the United States from the federa uh, federations of equal forces was decided long before Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. And he says that these bankers were afraid that the U.S., if they remained as one block and as one nation, would attain economic and financial independence, which would upset the financial domination over the world. So Bismarck knew that we were dealing with a imperial monetary interest that wanted to keep their financial control over the world. And so with that, now you're looking at the height of the need for funding of the Civil War and the same monetarist and banking interest that was trying to keep their power over the world wanted to make sure that Lincoln did not have the resources and the means to actually organize uh, the finances he needed to win the war uh, for the Union. And one of the things that they did is, I guess it was uh, around April 1861, um, that uh, Lincoln went and met with, along with uh, the Treasury Secretary, uh, with in in New York to apply for loans. They went to apply for loans for the um, for the the Civil War, and they were given a quote of, I think it was the people who wanted the war to fail and wanted the Union to fail, particularly. Uh, the banking interest said, "We'll give you a loan at 24 to 30, uh, 24 to 36 percent." Wow! <laughs> Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln said, "Forget about it. There's no way." And so, what happened was he rejected that, and a gentleman by the name of Colonel um, Colonel Dick Taylor. Uh, was actually put in charge of, of solving this problem of how we would fund the Civil War um, to fight for the Union. And 
and, you know, and his solution, this is what the colonel tells uh, President Lincoln at the time. He says, just get Congress to pass a bill authorizing the printing of a full legal tender treasury note and pay your soldiers and then go ahead and win the war with them also. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Lincoln said, well, wait a minute. Is, <laughs> is this, you know, are the people going to accept this? You know, are the American people going to accept? You know, we're just going to print some money. What are you talking about? And he says, t Taylor says, the people or anyone else will not have any choice in the matter. If you make them full and legal tender, they will have a full sanction of the government and be just as good as any money. Uh, as Congress is given the express right by the Constitution. And so, after this, what happens is Lincoln agrees to uh, the solutions of Colonel Taylor and he prints $450 million worth of what we know as greenbacks and he uses these new green bills printed, these bills printed with green ink on one side to distinguish them from other notes. And uh, what is understood about the issuance of these greenbacks is that the, the government it should, you know, is allowed to create an issue and circulate the currency and the credit needed to satisfy the spending power and the of the government and the buying power of consumers. The privilege of creating and issuing money is not only the supreme prerogative of government, but it is the government's greatest creative opportunity. And this is what Lincoln understood about the uh, nature of a credit system in which defined his uh, greenback policy. But what we're seeing there is what we've just done with this is we've used the power of our U.S. Constitution, used the, the power of the credit system to defeat uh, and to po pose what is necessary to defeat the monetarist, the British imperial interest of monetarism. And that's the power, that's the greatness of our U.S. Constitution and this universal principle of a credit system now which has governed uh, our fight against this British imperial monetary interest uh, throughout the course of the history of our United States. I mean, we have examples under President Franklin Roosevelt of that same concept, and we have um, examples under President Kennedy and others. And I think, you know, when we're thinking about this, now we can get away from, we can go back to, as I said before at the beginning, that the real challenge, the real fight that we're addressing here is the nature of the uh, credit system representing the advancements of the creative power of the human mind against the imperial interest of uh, destroying and reducing the world population. And not only that Lincoln understood stand that, but also uh, Chancellor Bismarck in Germany understood it, as well as uh, the Russian Tsar uh, Alexander II, who knew that the imperial interests were going to do everything in their power to try to keep their system of colonialism and uh, dominating the world powers uh, at, uh, at, their, at their hand. So this is what they wanted to destroy and it goes back to this very question of how the credit system has saved the existence of our republic but also has allowed for the existence of the sovereignty of other nation states throughout the planet. Keisha, there's a couple, two things. One, what would you say to the people who say that right now our bailout is just printing money as well. How is that different? And then it's we'll not start there. It's not. I mean, we are. It's we're we're doing pretty much the exact same thing that we were seeing that was taking taking course throughout this entire uh, throughout these these same periods where 
you had the printing of of money uh you had um you know you saw under under uh Andrew Jackson with the shutdown of the uh Hamiltonian Second National Bank uh this created a situation where you had uh the continuation of the downfall of uh the state state and local chartered banks because as you continue to pr print more money we're facing some of the same situations that they were facing then you would have uh you had these banks being lent money to but were not able to uh continue to keep the the currency uh in their banks the, they weren't able to keep it keep it liquid and so therefore you had uh, therefore, I mean, what you were you're dealing with is you don't have a specific currency of, of phys you don't have physical development uh, and development of, of infrastructure and so forth that actually was going along with the currency. At that same time, you had a lot of people who were you know facing foreclosure on their homes, and so when a home would be foreclosed on somebody could actually come in and buy that home at the at a fraction of the price that was what was going on during the time of you know following the the great crash of 1837 and following uh Jackson's uh veto of the second national bank so you're you're facing the same thing now and this is why what Lincoln did and what President Roosevelt did particularly in creating the uh, organize, organizing the Glass-Steagall Act, um, which actually gave a firewall of protection separating our investment banking from commercial banking, was a direct attack on this whole policy that had been, you know, governing the whole idea of the 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 money changers and the monetarist system, which had organized, uh, which had basically destroyed the existence of banking in the nation uh, and you had the same idea with the, the Great Depression of uh, of the 1920s of 1929 which led to uh, Lincoln's development I mean, to Roosevelt's development of the uh, Glass-Steagall Act uh, in order to put a kibosh on the money changers and the policies which uh, had uh, dominated and allowed for this collapse to happen. And so you're seeing the same policy and this is why what Mr. LaRouche is saying about the urgency uh, and what we are presenting as the clear urgency and the non-optional alternative uh, for organizing a return to Glass-Steagall banking reorganization and a return to a national banking credit policy. Uh, modeled on the ideas of Alexander Hamilton is so crucial because you can see how this represents the uh, concept which has been the driving factor of a credit policy universally throughout the existence of our republic. Right, and as, according to what Ben presented today, right now our necessity really is to go to, in, go to space and develop moon, develop, develop the moon and develop Mars and that's a type of development that is uh, it's you can't go without it it's not an option mm -hmm. and so that, that also seems to make then the credit system not an option it's interesting, all the cases that were discussed the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, what Hamilton did what Lincoln did the you know, what's the invariant? What's the sort? What's the real wealth in all those products? It's never in the money. The the money, the credit, always is always. It's always to do something, but that something's always relative. Mm -hmm. It's always to take the next step. Right? Wealth is never found just in. You know, it's not like we could issue credit the same way we did in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and build the same things and have it be the same effect. Mm -hmm. You know, real wealth is defined by how throughout all these histories we've discussed how we've been able to use the money system to facilitate mankind moving to the next level. 
moving to the next level of productivity, moving to the next level of frontiers. So it's just, I mean, everything we've discussed, it's just in our history that it's always, it's always in our ability to push the frontiers and to, to embark on the missions that's going to def redefine mankind's ability to support himself. Mm -hmm. you know, and Lynn's put a lot of emphasis on the thermonuclear platform, the idea of actually coming to a mastery of thermonuclear fusion as a baseline. I mean, it's, it's really, it's the equivalent of what the Saugus Ironworks was in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, you know, the different programs that Investments Hamilton was involved in. It's, it's never in the, 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 the progress is always in taking the next step, which is why the green ideology is so deadly right. and dangerous. But, but the, the frontier is very clear now, I think. It's that. Yeah, that's true. When you're talking about this question of the, the frontiers of development of mankind has always been what has driven uh, the greatness of our republic, of our nation, going back to the uh, discovery and the exploration of uh, Christopher Columbus into the New World, or you're looking at the, the frontiers of development that shape all of the discoveries that went along with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and you can continue that with Lincoln's railroad policy. You know, all of this was a manifestation of the credit policy, but it also was the principle which actually drove what would uh, become the common aims of mankind. You know, with the, with the uh, transcontinental railway system, this, is a, this is, was an organized policy uh, for development for the next step in economic platform, not only for the United States, and which became the, uh, at the pivot of the centennial of our, our nation. I mean, this is what everybody across the world was actually coming to admire, from Germany to uh, Russia to China, Every, uh, to uh, Greece or uh, Ireland, everybody was coming in to witness this magnificent uh, concept which had been developed by President Lincoln, which was exactly a kick and a blow in the face to this imperial system uh, which sought to continue to keep its empire, imperial control over uh, over nation states, over the United States, and so it was a, a complete uh, triumph to the existence of the United States and everything that our uh, Constitution and our Republic had stood for. And you saw that continuing through with uh, President Franklin Roosevelt with the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, and similar things happened with that. People wanted to come over and experience, you know, the breakthrough in new scientific and technological advancements and irrigation and farming and so forth at Roosevelt. So you had now a new uh, development in the common names of mankind. And so now we go to the, policy, the principle of uh, also the, what, Link, uh, what President Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy, was able to do with the, uh, with the development of the manned uh, moon mission. And that was always it's interesting because when you think about Kennedy's, uh, his, his platform, what, what he intended for the, the manned Mars mission, uh, and the accomplishments there were, were great, uh, were a great manifestation for not just the United States, but for uh, the potential for all of mankind. Now, it wasn't supposed to stop there. Kennedy had the intention for uh, the next step, the next level to happen, which would be to go out into the galaxy uh, with a, a, Mars, uh, a Mars mission. And this is what now we have to have as the continued policy of reaching what is going to exist and what is going to become uh, the common aims of mankind in, uh, one, in defeating this imperial policy and uh, this British empire which still seeks to, uh, to destroy mankind uh, today. Mm -hmm. The point that you made, I think, is it's crucial. Um, there's a funny thing with 
the example of Lincoln where he, his nickname as a candidate was the rail candidate. He uh -huh. was the railroad candidate. Mm -hmm. So it was something that was very central to his campaign and to his policy. It wasn't the afterthought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you normally think with all he did on the on the issue of slavery and with the Civil War, that that was the central feature of his policy. But in a sense, I think what has been made clear is that the real the real battle is over this question of the what is the next step or what is the internal improvements, the type of development that needs to be taken. And a lot of the wars and a lot of the monetary policies and a lot of these things are effects of that actual fight, which I think today is, is represented by the extraterrestrial imperative, uh, by what uh, Mr. LaRouche is, is, is giving the world uh, what the basement is developing and what we're getting out, what you guys as candidates represent. And the, the critical thing is that instead of the United States, you know, working as a tool of an empire, we have the opportunity to be working with Russia, with mm -hmm. China, to do exactly like what you're saying, which is to develop the common aims of mankind. Mm -hmm. And that is the real you know, that is reality right now. Um, and the, what I think is very clear from this discussion as we wrap it up is that this is the gift that the United States uniquely has to give. You know, the founders mm -hmm. of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and everything and everyone that went into that, that was in Europe that didn't make it over, they made a discovery on on really how we can, as a human species, organize ourselves mm -hmm. to become more productive, to actually increase our energy flux density. It wasn't just monetarily profitable, as Ben went through. We actually became much more productive than any existing factory of the t at the time. And so I think that mm -hmm. that is something unique to the United States culture that we really need to spread. And I think that's you know, obviously that is what your roles are as, as candidates, is to bring that out in people. And I know it's quite a challenge. But I think on that note, unless there's any last comments that anybody would like to make. Yeah, I'll just make, I think, to leave people with the, the optimism that has already been drawn out in this discussion, you know, we should take from the spirit of uh, space pioneer Kraft Erica and Kraft Erica actually derived, uh, developed three laws of uh, astronautics. And in his first law, he said that there is nobody and nothing under the natural laws of the universe that can impose limitations on man except man himself. And I think that is something that we can embody the spirit of and, and take from when we're thinking about what is required of mankind to actually take on this endeavor of a, a Moon-Mars mission of exploring his rightful place in the galaxy. And, you know, you have the greenie policies, the uh, budget cutters, the monetarist policy that says that it can't be done. Uh, but I think that if we take from Kraft Erica and understanding that there is no limitations to growth, there's no limitations to the aims of mankind, and this should be the, uh, the policy which shapes and the, the thinking which shapes all discussion uh, and trumps all of the insanity that you see coming out of these political debates that have no direction toward taking on what is uh, actually facing, threatening the existence of mankind and civilization, the threat of thermonuclear World War III, the threat of an insane president remaining in office and pushing a dictatorial power, policy. This is what should be the driving factor, this idea, the concept of the next leap in development of mankind and that there's no limitations to mankind's growth and so this should be the discussion on the table of all political debates. And just to add one more thing, just to bring it bring it all back together, that 
you know, what Ben was going through was this principle of creativity in the universe. We went through some of the, the historical examples that the United States was always specifically organized around driving and harnessing that principle of creativity, which was always the enemy of an imperial system. But it is the natural tendency of mankind. When that same way, the natural tendency of mankind, like life, is to colonize the solar system. And uh, Keisha just brought up Kraft Erica. Well, an another point he made is he said, well, you know, if, if the earth is just the infancy of man, or we're given everything that we, uh, that we consume here for us, well, the moon would be the childhood, and Mars would be the adolescence. And uh, it really is where you have to go, because you're not going to be creative sitting on the, on the, the planet. Uh, there are huge questions out there waiting for us. We have some intimations of some of them, but it's really going to reflect on our, our entire conception of, of the universe and space and time once we're able to go out there uh, and, and challenge our notions, as Ben gave a, f a few examples of how we know that it's not empty space and it's not stuff moving out from a single point. Well, we have a sense that there in, that uh, there's organization everywhere, uh, so there's not empty space. But also the question of time. Uh, Roosh has just wrote a paper on this recently and uh, made, made the point that now, well, for example, to, to go to Mars, you're going to need artificial acceleration. You're going to need fusion, 1G acceleration. One will be creating artificial gravity. Two will be challenging our conceptions of time. Because once you can travel that fast, and you can travel to galaxies which are beyond the uh, lifetime of, of, a, of an, a human individual from our current notions of possibility, once you can travel at a, at a proportion of the speed of light, the notion of a human lifetime has changed. Because what a human being can do in their lifetime is a completely different, different world. And so once we, get, once we can change that conception of, of mankind, that's going uh, to change, change the universe as well. It's, I mean, this is this is, these ideas have been accessible to us for a long time, but once we use the space program to make that conscious, that, that really is a, a potential renaissance for mankind. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Keisha, and thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, continue to tune in and please contribute to LPAC. We'll see you next time.